Preston, how you doing, man? Doing great. Like the shirt. <laughs> Absolutely. I had to sport this one that's, today. That's amazing. <laughs> you know, the, the funny thing is, is there's like a whole crowd of people around the world wandering around with Bedford t-shirts. <laughs> For me, it's, it's mind blowing. So I appreciate you, man. It's good to oh, see yeah. you. How great you been? seeing you. Doing good. Doing real good. We're right. up here in Nash Vegas. Nash Vegas. Yeah, man. I, I like it. This, this is a nice town. I like this. Well, we just came from New York and, uh, and New York's just a, like Danny was surprised how dirty it was. And yeah, uh, you saw some rats, didn't you? Saw a few rats just as I was buying a sandwich. <laughs> yeah. He was buying a sandwich and a rat ran across him and everything's expensive and dirty and shit. And we've come here and everything's like cool. Everyone's happy, yeah. sun shining. So good to see you, man. So me and Danny were talking about this show a few days ago. I mentioned it to you. I was like, what show are we going to make with Preston? And I was like, well, Preston's good on the macro stuff and everything's fucked. So should we do like, should we do an everything is fucked show? And then you ping me a presentation and you literally have the receipts for why everything <laughs> is fucked. <laughs> Dude, I've been trying to understand it. Yeah. Uh, everything's unwinding. Yeah. What's going on, man? Um, Everything's coming to a head, right? At the end of the day, it's just coming to a head. Uh, I would start off in the currency space. So when I'm just looking at how strong the dollar has become in the last year, um, it's starting to become a little unmanageable. And what's crazy is you're seeing the Fed. So as the dollar is getting really strong relative to all other currencies in the market, um, you're looking at the Fed and you're thinking, all right, so they're going to have to start making the dollar less valuable relative to all these other currencies. And you have the exact opposite dynamic playing out where the Fed's saying we're tightening and they are finally. And um, they're doing it in moves that are 50 basis points. And while that's happening, you have all these other central bankers that are not doing that. Like over in Japan, they're still doing yield curve control. So when you have them tightening and you have the Japans of the world doing yield curve control, you're not just increasing the dollar strength by one X, you're increasing it by like two X because it's, you know, it's, it's a relative game when you're talking currencies and boy, oh boy, I don't, I don't know what that, I have no idea how the market's going to be able to uh, deal with that playing out. So I'd, I'd tell you, that's the first thing is just the currencies itself are, are in a situation where they need to start going the opposite way where the dollar's weakening and everything else is getting stronger, but the, the global economy can't even begin to entertain that situation. Then you got all the currency stuff that's taken place. And I don't even think that, I don't even think we are close to any of that uh, adjudicating itself or kind of working itself out yet. I mean, Europe looks like it's about to, I mean, you can speak to this way better than I can. Um, the prices- I, pro I probably can't. <laughs> the pro yes, you can. The prices, I, I mean, I can only imagine going into the grocery store over there right now. Um, yeah, I mean, I've noticed the dollar pricing because I price all my ad deals in dollars and I run yeah. my accounts in pounds. So I have like a dollar line and a pound line. And uh, over the previous year, uh, the pound had strengthened against the dollar. Mm -hmm. So actually my relative income was dropping. Yeah. But but now with the dollar strengthening, I'm, I'm seeing it. Yeah. Um, it gets, it gets uh, uh, we, essentially we, we earn more for doing the same amount of work. Um, I'd rather it was more stable in terms of pricing over in the UK. Things are getting quite kind of weird. Uh, I mean, fuel is so expensive because it's yeah. much higher than it is here. You yeah. call it gas, we call it fuel. It's much higher, um, but it's just like everything's getting more ex expensive. There's a real issue with, with fuel poverty in the UK. My um, my fuel bill a year ago was about a hundred pound a month ish. Mm -hmm. You know, ranging from eighty maybe to a worst case wind to one hundred and thirty. It's 400 pounds a month now. Yeah. Three X. Yeah. 20% of people are in fuel poverty. They're about to issue a, a, like essentially a stimulus check, which is a credit for energy bills. I think this it was October we saw it, wasn't it? Yeah, October. Yeah, to help people with that. And they're not means testing it. So everyone gets it, which is also completely stupid because I can afford it. Um, and some people can't. So I just don't know what they're doing. There. Although the poorest in society do get more. If you're on benefits, you get more. Mm. I think I think what they should do is someone should do a pay it forward scheme. Like a lot of people are going to get this and they don't need it. But yeah, like stuff's starting to get weird. And then the news reports are coming out. 
um, yeah, families skipping meals so their kids can eat. Yeah, not uh, you know, not able to uh, fill up their car, going to bed early, and like under blan- blankets is it, it's really hitting the hardest in society. Um, yeah, everything's get, getting expensive. Yeah, and I don't mean to say this like sound like a twat. I don't notice as, as much like because I'm not on the edge, so you know, I I don't notice it as much. Uh, except when I do like fill up my car because yeah. it's gone from. You know, 80 pound fill up to 120 which is a big well, jump th- so jeff booth came up with a quote and i've kind of like adjusted very slightly where it's just if your currency isn't scarce everything else on the planet that people actually desire will become scarce yeah right and so i gave this talk up in pittsburgh it was an energy summit in pittsburgh and um I had some slides. We've and, got them. Yeah, you guys got the slides. No, no, we got them because what, what I think would be useful to do is like, let's. Yeah. Can we just go through them? Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah throw like it up there. Do you want to throw them up there? So, we, um, we, uh, some people will be on the audio. Oh, geez. Okay. Yeah. Um, so what will happen is in the video, uh, Ben will put them in the video, but in the audio yeah. only, people won't see. So we we should explain them. Okay. Well, the first thing I so I before I did this uh, talk up in Pittsburgh, I sat down. My uncle came over to visit. I was up there visiting some family. And uh, my uncle came over and I was showing him some of the slides and, and he looked at me and he's like, so these are really interesting and he's not in finance or anything. Mm-hmm. He's like, but it's just really confusing. Like there's, there's like a whole lot here that I just really can't wrap my head around. And so he said, when you're giving this talk tomorrow, he's like, I, you need to, you need to like level set with people so that they can kind of understand the, the gist of like what are these slides yeah. right and so um so i started off this presentation with with this story about monopoly and i said i said i want everybody here to picture that we have two monopoly boards you got four people playing on this board over here and you got four people playing on this board over here and each each of them have their own central banker that's adjusting the money supply in the game. Like everybody, you know, one of the players typically is the banker and also a player in the game. But let's just imagine that there's a fifth person there in, on each table that's adjusting the money supply. And the thing that makes this scenario different than most times when people play Monopoly is the players on this board can go over and buy the properties off of their own board or the other board. And same for the players on, on board too, they can buy properties on either board. So if you wanna go over and buy Park Place, you wanna own Park Place here and on the other board, you can do that. And I said, with this scenario, you're able to understand like how we got to this disastrous scenario that we're in. So let's imagine that both central bankers on both boards are not debasing the money. They, they've put uh, a fixed supply of currency in the board. You're playing it kind of by the rules. You're actually debasing it a little bit. Every time somebody goes around go, they collect 200 and you're adding more currency into the into the game. But let's just let's just say that that's the normal way that the game's played. So if that's, both that's, of them, that's, that's your 2% inflation. There we'll just call that the 2% yeah. inflation, right? So when when you're playing this, um, you know, you're you're seeing the the players play the game, but let's just play out a scenario. Let's say that one of the central bankers kind of whispers to the other four players on that, we'll call it board one. And he says, all right, instead of collecting $200, I'm going to, I'm going to drop $700 into the game. Every time you go around, go just don't tell the other board. Right. Mm -hmm. And this, what I'm describing here is when, when there's no peg to the currency in the globe, it becomes a race to the base because what's going to happen for the the board one players, they're going to get their $700. They're going to look across both boards and say, all right, where can I, where can I capture the most uh, rent for the properties and which property pays me the most? And they're going to just gobble that up faster than everybody else. And so you can imagine these players on board too that don't know that they're getting this $700 instead of $200 as they're going go. All of a sudden, those four players from board one just keep showing up over on their board and they're just gobbling up all the property and they're like, what the heck is going on, right? Well, it doesn't take long for the players on board number two to to realize like, why is there so much currency from board one coming over here? 
And so they kind of like lean into the table and, and they're like, I think they're cheating over there. And it, the only way we can compete is if we try to try to cheat as well. Right. And so they look at their central bank and they're like, all right, you got to match that or or we need a thousand added into the game every time we pass go. Don't tell board one. And so what you have is this dynamic where the players on the board are trying to to claw more and more cash into the game without you know making it obvious and without it being so over the top. And this is this is the uh, continuing effect. This is you know many people in in the space talk about these ideas, but I don't think people can really kind of easily visualize why that back and forth in this debasement race is is taking place. So once you, when you play this game out, like if I was going to ask you, what's the fastest way to play the game of Monopoly? Like if you wanted to just accelerate Monopoly in the game, the fastest way to do it is just start changing the amount of cash that's getting inserted into the game uh, every time somebody goes around go or or you can you can add it anywhere you want. You can come up with whatever rules you want. But if you keep adding bigger and bigger amounts into the game, what you're getting is the consolidation of equity because those that equity on the board is scarce mm -hmm. there's no more of it just like oil or like you can dig more oil out but the infrastructure is the thing that's limiting how much of that can actually be dropped into the market without you know more infrastructure growth in that particular area real estate that's a especially in cities why is the real estate exploding michael saylor goes into like this whole idea of uh inflation being an, a vector and when you go and you, and you pull it back and you look at the scarcity around the things that people actually desire, healthcare, education, real estate in, in Washington, D.C., or any, any major uh, city where, where things are being conducted, especially political things are, are happening. You can see how that becomes very, that, that becomes the thing that, um, going back to, to, the, to the quote that I was talking about, which is, if the currency isn't scarce, Everything else that people desire becomes scarce, and you can you can see that play out in that monopoly example. So, with that, that by the way, that that's that is something I'm going to steal to explain this to people. It's a brilliant way of explaining. Oh yeah, it's just so it, easy. Everyone understands monopoly. Yeah, you know, everyone understands two hundred pound. Well, it's two hundred pound to Pasco in the UK, and you know you're running out of money, so you have to like wait yeah. and just wait to get round to get your two hundred. Yeah. And then, or maybe I can buy this property. Like you have like there's financial discipline involved yeah. in the game. You flood it with cash. There's no financial discipline. It's brilliant. Yeah. Well, and what's what's really fascinating. You can also describe UBI and QE with Monopoly. So, QE is simply anybody who owns equity. Let's say you you and I were playing with two other people, and you had all the equity on the board. QE is the central bank coming in and saying, Peter, uh, we need to get more liquidity in the game. So here's how we're going to insert it: sell us your these three properties for the price that's listed or whatever price the the collective group thinks it's worth right now, which it would have been bid at this point, right? We're going to give you cash and we're going to claw that equity off the board. And it's now going to sit on our balance sheet, right? And now what are you going to do with that cash? Is it, is it going to trickle down into the game? Of no. course not. You're going to then go to the other three players who have very minimal equity, very minimal property cards, and you're going to then buy those with the cash you just got. That's QE. Instead of it being the properties, it's bonds, right? right? They're coming in, they're they're inserting that cash into the system. They're clawing the bonds out. The yields are getting compressed. When yields go down, the values of properties shoot to the moon. And then you, the rich guy with all that inserted fiat, right? You're like, all right, well, I'm just going to buy some more assets that have free cash flows. I'm not going to you know, I guess you might go buy a couple of high end yachts, but like that's not trickling down into the economy at all. Nope. Right. UBI is really kind of the 200 in when you pass go. So hold on, on the, Q, on the QE, does, yeah. does that actually create locked up pools of capital? That Absolutely. Have nowhere to go. Absolutely. That's and that's why you're seeing that's why when you go back and you look at 2008 till now, right? The reason that you've seen this polarization of wealth effect into the one percenters is because that's what QE does. QE is this idea, this, this academic idea that if we put cash into the system, it'll just trickle on down into, into the lowest levels. 
and it doesn't it just <laughs> but is it, is it really that or is it like a, a temporary uh, stop gap to stimulate the market and kick the can down the road knowing the problems that exist like surely they know this it's themselves a, well and think about it if you're gonna if you're gonna do this it does kick the can it does get the economy going and it does it in a way where nobody even understands what the hell just happened right and i think that's the real important part is they're able to do this where there's because it's total market manipulation in the fixed income space, period. It just sounds to me, it's like a tightening of the elastic band. It gets tighter, gets tighter, tighter, absolutely. tighter, tighter, ping. It's exactly right. All right, the, what's the UBI one? So on the UBI front, so the, the same idea, you got to get liquidity into the game. Yeah. Everybody at the, you're having consolidation in the game into Peter's hands. You own everything, right? Danny and Jeremy are broke. And, and me, yeah. You could say that we're the other three players. But I want I want you to pay rent when you land on my property. Every every move I make, uh, it's it's cash flow or it's cash that's coming out of our pocket straight into yours because you hold all the equity on the board, right? Uh -huh. And so the UBI is how do we how do we get these how do we convince these guys to keep playing this game because obviously when we were doing the QE it became very obvious that you were the beneficiary of that and we were the chumps that still sat at the table right UBI is well let's just hand out $500 just stop the game everybody gets $500 now go but you had no reset of the equity no right and so as we keep playing, yeah, we have cash right now and everybody's happy because they can breathe again. But as we roll the die and we go to the next, oh, sh he's got four hotels on that. I just, all my $500 goes straight to Peter McCormick, right? You have to keep providing it, keep so providing it. You don't get a debt jubilee until the equity and the ownership of the assets explodes. Yep. Okay. And so um, when I look at, you know, Bitcoin and kind of the direction that all this is going, the thing that really explodes in the, in the end game of all this is the debt blows up. Yeah. So all these people that are sitting on that debt and thinking that they are sitting on an asset when inflation is 8% and it's yielding 3% and they're negative 5% by holding it, that's a liability. Now it performs better than cash, which is down 8%, but that's, that's the thing that really kind of blows up in the end is all those debt promises can't get serviced if, and this is the big if, if there's a new currency that can be trusted and actually uh, inserted into the game that everybody starts trusting more than the old currency. Okay. Danny, yeah. can you just Google up uh, Monopoly Socialism? Yes. So I've got this, I bought this game. Just Oh, I've never even heard of yeah, this. No, yeah. there's a, I, I don't know if Monopoly did it itself or it's like this rogue thing, but there is a, there is a just find the box. Yeah, Monopoly so Socialism, winning is for capitalists. Yeah, so like it's a par it's a parody. Uh, has it got any other like details of it? How you play it? I remember playing it with my kids and they hated it. <laughs> you, you, but you need an example of the cards, Danny. See if you can buy. Uh, uh, can you Google Monopoly Socialism chance cards and just go to Google Images? I don't know if you'll get it. It's, it's worth the cards. Out. Yeah, it's because they're just ridiculous. Uh, but uh, you know, in general, Pete, yeah. it's it's a great example for people to just be able to graphically in their minds, just wrap their head around some of these. <laughs> you go free eyeglasses for everyone. That'll make your 2020 vision better. Pay the bank $10 from the community. You, know, you have the community, <laughs> community fund. fund. <laughs> so you put money into the community fund, it goes out and pays for everything, but you end up playing. You can never get to a point of winning. It's, it, oh, wow. Yeah. And so I played it with my kids as uh, to try and teach them why too much socialism doesn't work anyway. These are these are some very basic ideas that people can take this fancy jargon, quantitative easing. What yeah. the hell's that? UBI. What the heck's that? Um, yield curve control, right? There's another term that we could quickly kind of cover, and 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 this is all leading to some of these yeah, slides. Yeah. But th I tried to start off the presentation talking about some of these ideas, and and it was amazing because this was an energy summit. These are people up in the Pennsylvania area, which is energy rich area. And they just they're seeing that they need to mine Bitcoin because they can see what it's doing to their to their P and L, and they're like, but I don't think that they fully understand like what why in the world are people willing to pay for that service of mining? What's all that about? Like what the heck's happening? So I tried to provide this big giant macro overview, and I mean at the end of the event I had an hour's worth of people waiting there to ask questions because it wasn't. They've never really looked at it from that macro lens. They were just looking at it more from a micro lens of, 
hey, we need to start mining Bitcoin because obviously it's it's going to help us make money and we're way more profitable and we can compete in a much better way than we would without it. It's and and Pete, this stuff is when you look at mining and energy, I mean, it's just becoming part of their their infrastructure. It's going to have to be if they're going to be competitive in the future. Unless they're in New York. Unless <laughs> New York just shot themselves straight in the foot. New York keeps shooting. It's like they don't. It's like, do you not want anyone to live here? <laughs> it's fear. It's all fear. The people that are that that control the equity in that state are fearful of this thing, and they should be concerned about like what that change brings. Mm -hmm. But that ch change brings opportunity if they embrace it. But the fear is just driving all their decision making. And hey, you know, let's work. Let's work through these charts. Yeah, go then. through the okay, charts. Okay, so the first one. So I've watched this video twice now. This Ray Dalio one. Yeah, uh, and yeah. So uh, we'll explain the chart in a second. Yeah, but, um, yeah, and uh, and we'll put it in the show notes, Danny. We'll put it in the show notes. People should watch this uh, long term debt cycle. It, it was fascinating for me yeah. just just to see it vi visually laid out. Um, but see, this is the, the chart you've got here is essentially. This is Lynn's chart too. Oh, it's this Lynn's chart. Yeah, so, Lynn made this chart. So, so for so people um, listening, there's like a it it shows interest rates in the monetary base, and then what during the 30s to kind of like mid. 40s you can see where the Bretton Woods agreement yeah. was back in the 40s and the the blue line is the one that I'd tell people to focus on so when you're looking at the blue line and this is the 10-year treasury I believe uh yeah that's the ten, that's the 10-year treasury it peaked out in like 16 percent or something like that in in the 80s and so what you're able to see with that is you can graphically see this 80-year cycle okay and you can see how once those once those yields start getting compressed down to nothing that's when things, that's when your supply chains start to break uh -huh. and they break because the cost of capital, like people talk about price controls mm -hmm. and they talk about how, oh, you don't want to con control the price of corn because then that'll cause all these disruptions into the market, right? Well, when you talk about the cost of capital itself, which is the the yield that you get on money itself or on, on currency itself, that's the ultimate price control. That's you saying, I'm going to control the price of everything, everything. And they've been, and with QE, that's that's what you're effectively doing. You're stepping into the market and say, we should control like almost like uh, the genie in Aladdin. You know, you're like, I'm controlling everything. And so here at the end, when you start getting down into those, into those uh, nothing percent yields, you're gonna get the supply chains to break because people d cannot perform economic calculation when there's no cost to borrow. Or, it's, or even better yet, over in Europe, negative rates, or in Japan, negative rates. That makes no sense in nominal terms, not yeah. just in real time, nominal terms. Like, how can't you think things aren't going to start breaking down in society when you're telling people, hey, give me $100 and I'll give you back 95 <laughs> right? And it's a, it's a deal for you. I'll lock it up for five years and I'll give you back less. That's how insane some of these academics with the MMT and all the other stuff, like they're they're off the rocker. Yeah, but at the same time, if you're holding cash and you're looking at high inflation and you are given that ability to maybe beat it by it being locked up, it might make sense to some people. Well, they're they're trading it. They're, yeah. Most of these most of these people managing these billion dollar bond tranches, and Greg Foss would, you know, if he was sitting here, he could attest to it. Yeah. Is they are they are trading the Fed and they're trading whether the Fed are like, all right, they're going to have to step in. And when they step in, they're going to push these yields lower because they're going to become a buyer. They're going to be that QE buyer. And they're just they're 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 weighing the probabilities of their actions to make money on it. And that's it. They're not looking at it as like, I'm going to hold this thing through maturity at all. So. That's a challenge. So that's that's all I was really trying to show with this chart is I was telling people you're in a long term debt cycle. Here's uh -huh. the graphical proof where you can see it because you can say that and be like, oh, I don't believe that. But here's the chart that shows you that you're in this long term debt cycle. When you look at those little uh, when you see those jumps, yeah, that's your short term uh, yeah. credit cycles yeah. that are playing out and you can graphically see those and then you can see this response with the monetary base. So go to the next slide, guys. Yeah. And um, so here's from 2008. You can see how 
they were able to manage all of this. And you can see the nice smooth line going into 2008. And that's when they started doing quantitative easing. Because of the crisis. Because of the financial crisis. But the, the weird thing is, at the time, that felt like a global financial crisis. And it was. Uh, yeah, and it was. Yeah. yeah. But the the increase in the base, what's that about? About one point two trillion dollars. Yeah, you can see you can see the move in two thousand eight and how big of a deal that was, and then you can see how aggressive it has become since. Yeah. Like the response on COVID, they have doubled that response just through um, more QE that's been happening, and, and I don't even think people realize that they have continued to do that insertion of this monetary base right so so people are listening prior to the 2008 crisis that looks about 900 billion on the fed balance sheet and it looks like it goes up to about one point sorry you've 10x yeah yeah, Yeah. to about 1.4 trillion yeah and then from 2009 to about 2018 it's gone up to 4 trillion and and then in the space of a year it's gone up to 8.9 trillion (laughs) The the reason I put this slide in there was to show people. So this is what happened in the United States. But I think if you go to the next slide, I haven't looked at these enough. Hold couple. on, just a question yeah. on this. Go back to a second, yeah. Danny. Like from your analysis of this, like it, it yeah. felt like everything that happened in two thousand eight, they had to do. It was kind of responsible, and they were able to protect the global economy from complete collapse. They were able yeah. to uh, rescue, like um, like in the UK, they were able to rescue Royal Bank of Scotland and. Lloyd's and uh, over here was F- and Fannie Mae, Fannie Mac, is yeah, that it? And, yeah. and was it, there was a few that were, were able to Bear be rescued. Stearns, yeah, Bear yeah. Stearns were able to be rescued. And, and that, that seems like a sensible plan. They pr- rescued the economy. I would, I would, I don't know if I would use the word sensible. I would say they, it, uh, it was, they had to do it. Yeah. If you were in the seat, if I was in the seat, if Danny was in the seat, anybody was in the seat, they would have had to have done something similar. Now, whether they chose the magnitude that was, the magnitude of that reaction was a mathematical decision. I I, I would like to think okay. that they're saying, "Hey, we had this much liquidity, you know, explode, uh, impaired, and so therefore we need this much of a response." They inserted into the market, and each one of these each one of these jumps are mathematical decisions that they're having to make and, and estimate. Like the 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 credit was impaired this many trillions now. And this is how much we have to respond with. So, what happened uh, apart from 2000, apart from it being Donald Trump, what actually happened under that administration? Because that, there's another big jump from 2012 essentially to 2015. So, over in Europe, you had a, a major crisis in that time frame, and there was a big response okay. that that also happened. Okay, yeah. and I'm then not- and, and sorry, Danny, ju- and then just looking at what happened over COVID, there's an increase from four trillion to essentially nine trillion. Have you actually looked? At what, like, could it have been a three trillion or two trillion? Like, has it been massively irresponsible, or as as, as the increase in the balance sheet essentially with th- things that they would have to do selling that seed? I I I don't know the answer yeah. to that, Pete. I think that um, I think they have no idea what the right answer for any of this is. I think they just huh. know they have to put more units, more fiat units into the system to keep. Uh, social unrest from brewing more. And do you think the decision making is based on that, or do you think it's politically based to try and retain power? It's like, like they mm. do want to, like, it's, you know, it's not popular to allow things to unwind. It's not popular to not give people stimulus checks. It's not, like, it's, you know. I think it's just the, the, the desire for stability. Right. Okay. Right. If you're playing the game, yeah. if you're playing the Monopoly game and you're crushing the three of us, right? The last thing you want is for us to stand up and say, we're not playing this game anymore. Throw the board of the table. That's right. You've got to just, you've got to keep giving us stimulus so that we continue to play the game. Because if we stand up and quit playing, like you got a real issue on your hands in this world where you own everything. Yeah. Huh. So I think they're just looking at it, not from necessarily, I mean, it is control, but it's more a desire to, to, protect what it is you have and keep stability in the system. Danny. Which is control. I mean, I, I yeah, don't want to mince know. words, but I, I... I was just thinking, so if you look at after 2008, um, there's a little dip in their um, balance sheet. I, I guess that's maybe like 10, 20% or something like that, yeah. where they've reduced the balance sheet. 
They're obviously trying to do that again now. Do you think they get another 10, 20% dip and it goes up again? Or do I think like, they can take a trillion out? Uh, like clearly it wasn't oh, sustainable no. then. Yeah, I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't think you're going to get there. But at some point, Preston, either they've got to unwind this or they keep going. But if they keep going, it's like we enter full Weimar territory. Oh, yeah. That's where this is going. So you do, you, you oh, yeah. think we're going? Oh, God, yeah. That's not even hard. And how does it... <laughs> Okay, fine. And I don't want to, and I don't yeah. want to sound like you know, like death and destruction, but like this is a math problem, right? This is just math. Like they can't take that out. Like looking at looking at everything that that's about to go down. In in my opinion, in the coming two to four quarters, coming like the coming year to year and a, or a half a year, like things are about to to get insane. So they're talking, and, and the reason they're talking about like, oh, we're going to tighten, we're going to reduce the balance sheet. They're doing that because they have to, they have to get inflation under control, but they're at such a, they're, they're, they're cornered into the room. So, so far that I just don't know how they could possibly do that based on the inflation that's there, the current existing rates, the other countries that are getting clobbered with dollar denominated debt need easing on the dollar. Uh, I just don't know how that can happen. Just go back one chart, Dan. It's Danny. Sorry. So looking at the previous chart where there was a massive increase in the monetary base, it was it was reduced from the 50s to the 80s. The red line, yeah? Oh, so yeah. So you're talking about in the previous yeah. period of so time. Do you think this will just match it? We'll have a massive no. rise in... Oh, you and here's, here's what I think is very different about back then to now. Okay. Is back then, you had people, you had a society and a culture that understood why it was important to be financially responsible. Huh, okay. Now, and this is on a global scale, this just isn't a US dynamic. Culturally, you got people that are, where the hell's my handout? Where the hell's the thousand dollars or the four thousand dollars that I need mailed to me? What what in the world are they doing to help me with my gas prices? I need some type of gas credit, right? People aren't saying, well, we need to let the free market, the free and open financial markets figure this out. And if the cost of gas is nine dollars, well, so well, you better start driving less. Like, ain't nobody on this planet saying those things right now. Right. So you got a you got a completely different cultural dynamic of financial responsibility, and and think about it, if we just watched for the last decade, the central banker step in and hand Pete a bunch of money, with QE, right, and and Pete go, oh hey thanks, and I'll have that final property that you hold, Danny and Preston, I'll have your last final property. I'll gobble those up. And now you literally own all the equity on the board and we own nothing and we'll be happy, according to the WEF. Huh. Um, nobody, and that's why you're seeing that culturally manifest itself where people are so frustrated that they're they're all at each, other th each other's throats because they own nothing. They're in debt up to their eyeballs. And they're not happy. And they're not happy. Because they're, think about it, what's a slave? It's a person who owns nothing and has an, is indebted to make payments with their time and energy to another person and can't do anything. And is there any talk of a debt jubilee? Would that well, be- Well, it's Bitcoin. Okay, um, well, we, yeah. yes, yes, but- Because Bitcoin blows up the debt. Hmm. OK, it when when you're looking at Bitcoin's performance on a long enough time frame versus what people would go to as safety, which was the bond market. And that gets so far upside down, like right now, five percent people sitting on that fixed income desk, they're saying, oh, this is really bad. But eventually the Fed's going to do things and it's going to bring you know inflation down and, and like we'll be in the positive again in nominal terms and, and in real terms. But what if it doesn't? What if it does the opposite? And and that and for me, that's my base case is that you're going to continue to see these inflation prints and these supply chains continue to break down and they're not going to be able to get it under control. And they're going to then implement yield curve control, which means that they're going to peg the yields at 3% because people who own homes can't afford for it to go any higher, right? Because everybody's in debt up to their eyeballs. So if they're pegging those yields at really low interest rates and you got this massive spread because supply chains are breaking down, 
you have to ask yourself, how long can people in the fixed income space, the bond market, sit there and eat a negative five or a negative 10% return before they say, I'm not owning that and I've got to own something else. And then all that monetary energy shifts itself, continues to shift itself into this thing called Bitcoin. And, and are we, do you think we're seeing any of that? Because at the moment, we seem to be like a, a correlated risk asset. You're seeing that because the market cap is a pittance right, in Bitcoin, okay. re and relatively speaking. Like we're talking about $100 trillion markets in fixed income versus okay. Bitcoin. It's, I don't even know what it is, $700 billion right now or something? Yeah, yeah, something like that. I mean, that's just a joke yeah. in, in, in relative size. So, you know, I asked Luke Roman a similar question, like, so where do we start to see that pivot kind of start happening? He thought it was around like $20 trillion in a Bitcoin price that would that would then really start waking up the market and the market just like, all right, so clearly this this goose is cooked. Yeah. Hmm. All right, Danny, let's go forward. To go, yeah, go forward. So this is the US. And so when you go back one real fast, Danny, so this was the US's response. But my point was, this just isn't happening in the US. So like going back to the monopoly hmm. example, let's say we have five boards instead of just two. And it's not just one central bank that's inserting, it's all five of them. And then it starts getting to a point where things get so unstable that now the central bankers are standing up. The Let's say there's five different boards. The five central bankers are standing up and, and they're like, all right, this is getting uh, this is getting unstable, right? I'll I'll debase for the next, you know, 10 moves and then you debase for the next 10 moves. And then you debase for the 10 moves after that. And it becomes this global coordinated, think BIS, WEF, um, IMF. Hmm. What the hell do you think they're actually doing behind, behind closed doors? Right? They have to keep this coordinated. So go to this next slide. Okay, so you're going to see that there's times when the when the Fed is, is debasing pretty hard and sometimes when the ECB is debasing pretty hard. Okay, and... And so there's the Fed, the European Central Bank, Bank uh -huh. of Japan, and the People's Bank of China, the, the big four central banks. Okay. So now what if we could take all of those lines, smush them into a single line, market cap weight them for the, for the value of that currency, and go to the next slide, and that's this. And that's what it looks like. And it's this fairly smooth line. You can see that in, at the start of 2018, they collectively, uh, as a global coordinated body, unelected global body, <laughs> um, tried to to start to. Um, I don't even. I wouldn't even call that tightening. I would call that normalizing, is what the attempt was. Right. And so you can see globally, they were trying to normalize together. Um, and so that's where you're seeing it go there. And then all of a sudden, COVID, COVID happened. But what you're gonna, if you went back and you really drilled into the charts prior to COVID, they were already. You can see a little bit of the bump there yeah. in the in the line. This this market was already going into a recession. They were already globally starting to to ease again. Uh, go back a slide, uh, Danny. You can see it here real well. Look at the Fed in mid 2019. COVID yeah. didn't happen until 2020. Yeah. Right. You can see they were already starting the base. Every one of them were starting the base except for the ECB. And I would say that's whenever it was going to start picking up again, whether COVID even happened. So go to the next chart. So so what we've seen, we've seen a dip now here in this uh, total assets of major central banks over yep. the last, is that basically the last three months or the last month? Yeah, this is, it's really from the start of the year. Right. And, and okay. And that's why we've seen equities get absolutely smashed. Absolutely hammered. You know, Bitcoin has, hasn't survived, but that's 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 a signal of where we're going. I'm stacking cash since the start of the year. Interesting. Yeah. So, so you're and waiting. I have a couple of posts. You can go into Twitter and you can find them. Well, you that, told me this in Miami, though. Yeah. You said there's going to be a time to jump into equities. No, uh, that's oh, no. that's way down the future. Okay. Yeah. So what are you it's, stacking it, cash for? For me, it's it's a cash Bitcoin world. Okay. It's the dollar and it's Bitcoin. Okay. And so when I saw this, and, and I pay very close atten attention to these these charts, these uh, central bank moves, because 
they're inserting fiat units into the game back to the monopoly. You have the central bankers that are adding units into the game or they're clawing units out of the game or they're allowing the 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 credit, which only makes that example more confusing. And I can kind of explain that if you guys want to get into it. But um, when those when those credits or when those units are being clawed out of the game, the value of everything has to go down relative to those units. Yep. And so when I saw the, the central bankers collectively at the start of the year, they had this massive negative spread in fixed income. I knew they had to get it under control. This is them trying to get it under control. And they, they have to let impairment happen, which is the promises between individual entities. They have to let that blow up because that's money basically disappearing out of the game. And then they're clawing units out of the game. And so when they're doing that, you want to be long fiat, believe it or not. But, but it's going to be a very short-lived uh, holding period. Like if, if you talk to me in three months from now or six months from now and I wasn't stacking fiat and I was stacking Bitcoin again, that shouldn't surprise you. Um, okay. I had this conversation with a few people now. Um, I've, I've, I've heard a few times now there's the belief that they're going to be raising interest rates up until the midterms. And then about September is about the time to yeah. perhaps be buying Bitcoin. But Bitcoin's yeah. going to get hit with these interest rate rises over the next few months. The the thing I would watch for uh -huh. is the headline in the Wall Street Journal for something like central bankers add three trillion, five trillion, ten trillion collectively into the global economy with yield curve control. And I don't think it's going to be that. I think it's going to be more QE and UBI. And it's going to be UBI in the form of uh, offsets with the fuel, the energy yeah. expenses. And just every day, anything that, that is an everyday expense, they're going to be providing some type of offset to that. And they're going to have to do it through, and they won't be calling it, they most likely won't be calling it UBI, but it's UBI. It's, hey, if it costs $5 to fill up a tank of gas, per gallon to fill up a tank of gas, now it's $2 because of some socialized three dollar offset which is ubi right and that's the time to be stacking bitcoin if they're doing it in, at a scale that is in the trillions right if you're talking like if, if it was one trillion i'd probably be a little hesitant to to say that that's the pivot point if you're talking like five to ten trillion then i think that that's the reversal of, of their activity five, i think it's gonna be very obvious five to ten trillions doubling the balance sheet again yeah exactly uh, so yeah. that is going to tighten the band even more. You're just you're you're providing a narcotic to a dying patient. Yeah, yeah. I, I, have you actually run through how it all eventually blows up? I mean, the 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 blow up is in bonds. The and so what does that mean, and what does that mean to who, and um, you know, so for in in the the. I don't want to go too far because any person who says that they know how this is going to play out, I think is you've got to be very suspect listening to what they have yeah, to say. But you, it's generically, scenario planning. Yeah, ge generically, I would say if that scenario plays out, because that's what's going to provide the relief to the normal person who's in debt up to their eyeballs, is if you own a house and it's 90% levered, and all of a sudden that currency that that contract says blows up because all, you know, you own a house that says you're going to pay it back in pounds. Mine yeah. says, I'm, you know, I'd pay that back in dollars for, for people that have that, uh, have that liability on their balance sheet. And the currency now looks like everybody's pivoting and using something else. Um, that's going to be the thing that re provides relief to that person because it's going to get easier for them to pay that, that. 30 year mortgage back when they're getting paid in something that's a, a aggressively appreciating in value like bitcoin like bitcoin okay now where the challenge comes with this scenario is you're going to have a lot of dislocation in in just business enterprises in general because of this shift and because not every business is going to be able to figure it out um it's, mu they, it's musical chairs right you got to go and get chairs that's right and so if you're in a job, let's say you're employed and you have a, a job in something that um, is highly sought after 
regardless of what the economic circumstances are, a depression-like scenario or a booming economy, and you, you're always employed, you're going to be able to make this transition a whole lot easier than a person who has a job that isn't going to perform so well in a depression-like scenario. So that dislocation is what's going to make it hard for the person who's in debt up to their eyeballs. They don't have a job to collect the Bitcoin, right? But the person who who can sustain a job and and can pivot to owning this new currency, it's just going to get easier and easier for them to make the payment on that house. Hmm. So this is probably going to lead to a lot of civil unrest. Uh, yeah, I think that this is going to lead to civil unrest. The scale and the magnitude, I think, is highly dependent on the speed of the transition. So if this would blow up quickly, I think that that you're going to have way more dislocation. If you if this happens slowly over, call it a five or 10 year period of time, I think the dislocation could be handled m much more. You know, Ray Dalio calls it a beautiful deleveraging. Um, I would never use those terms. Because um, it doesn't feel beautiful. Uh, uh, there's nothing beautiful it's about not, it's it. It's a for, horrific for, deleveraging. For most people, yes. On a net basis, it's not a beautiful anything. And so is it as simple as the bond market switches over to the Bitcoin market? So you're just going to find that the owners of the bond market, you have to ask, like, they're, they're, it's a store of value, right? They're just storing value. They're not really trying to crush it. They're not trying to outperform anything because they're clearly not. I mean, they have for the last 40 years because they just keep getting bid. But here in the short term, they're going to find out that it's it's slowly disappearing, that it that it's a store of value and that it keeps going up. And so that's where the transition is going to going to come to Bitcoin, where it's a store of value and it keeps going up on a long enough time time frame. And the volatility over time will start to, um, you know, it'll start getting better, but it's not going to be for a while. You got a lot of time left before I think the volatility is going to start calming down. Right. Are there any more charts? Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's more. So okay. So this is a this is a neat one here where you're taking that previous slide where you have the consolidated uh, central bank balance sheet, and then you're comparing it just to the S and P 500, which always is a more volatile reaction to it. Yeah. And it, the the most interesting part on this for me is in that 2018 to 2020 time period where they were trying to normalize and you can see the equity markets wow. just throwing a fit, a volatility fit. Yeah. And I think that what you're going to find is that volatility fit is going to just continue to amplify itself. You go back into Germany and you look at a lot of people post this gold chart that we go from like 1920 to like 1925 on on the price of gold in in marks. Uh -huh. And what you find is when you look at just the price action, it just looks like this parabolic rip just straight up. But if you plot the volatility, it looks a lot like that chart where it's the, the volatility in the price action is actually getting uh it's just blowing out like you would see uh in a vibes like engineering scenario right before something has a systematic break. D uh, but, by the way, do you do you think gold has any role to play in this at all? Is it? Is it? Is there any? You're just trying to get me in trouble now. No, I, I, you look. <laughs> look, I, I mean, I, I've often thought, you know, even just put like three percent of my Bitcoin into gold, just in case, just yeah. in case. And like every time, I was like, Nah, don't do it. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of gold, um, mostly because of just the utility. When you can't send it immediately and clear it. There, it opens itself up to so many shenanigans. Oh, okay. That's the part. And so when you're talking about derivatives markets and everything that needs to to catch this disaster that's brewing, and, and it's all about trust. Like this whole transition is about you're going from this system where nothing can be trusted to something that that will that has to be demonstrating like unshakable, unmanipulable trust. That's what Bitcoin is. And so to, to transition over to something like that, you, then you got gold competing competing with Bitcoin. I don't trust the gold markets hmm. for a second. Now, if I'm sitting on like gold bars, which I'm not, um, for me individually, I guess it's going to retain my buying power of what that is today into whatever time in the future. I think that it'll, that it'll do that. 
but I don't see it. I mean, gold is the issue. Gold is the reason that these charts exist on a sovereign level. Mm. Okay. The reason that, that you had that, that from the forties to the eighties to the seventies is because gold, you can, you can debase against gold. If you're setting a currency to ride on top of the gold, go, let's go back to the monopoly example. Yeah. I've got, let's just say I have a hundred ounces of gold that are backing all that currency in the game. Okay. And, and I'm adding more currency into the game but I'm not actually buying more gold to back that additional currency that's coming into the game because that's what you have to do in order to sustain the peg. So in order for somebody to call me on that as the banker, one of those other people playing on one of the other boards comes over and he's like, I don't believe your ledger. I don't believe that the amount that you have in the game versus the, the gold that you have underneath the table that you're not showing anybody um, I don't believe that the ratio is a hundred to one like you did when you started the game, hmm. right? And you know what that central banker is going to say to that other person who's asking? Sorry, I'm not going to show you. Go piss off, right? That's that's yeah. that's exactly the scenario that's played out. And so, and the reason that this is all collectively happening, everybody knows Bretton Woods was the 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 dollar is going to be pegged to gold. And everybody else is going to peg to the dollar. So effectively, the world is pegged. Mm. But if the person who's managing that peg is changing that ratio and they don't have to prove it, and how do you prove it? How do you prove it? Right? I could go in there and cut the gold bars in half and fill the middle of them with lead. Mm -hmm. Right? And, oh, we're going to do an audit. On every one. Are you going to really strip down every every bar of gold? Are you going to actually show that to another country? If, like, If there's anything there. If there's, if it's even there, if it's even there, if it's even there, so that's wouldn't it, why. Wouldn't it be wild if they were guarding an empty building? I think that the 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 chances of some of that being true throughout the world is extremely high, uh -huh. right? And and what makes us think that something that has happened time and time and time again for millennia is all of a sudden going to be different? It's. It's not. It's almost. Like, it's almost like <laughs> it we, requires trust. Yeah, it's almost like we need a trustless form of money, which exactly. separates money from state. Exactly. So, all right, uh, let's go to the next one. Uh, you yeah, can, this is this is interesting. A lot of people have seen this chart. This is. Yeah. This only goes out to 2018, and I couldn't find the one that I can only imagine what this chart looks like if you carried it out to today. Well, this this for me was just a big highlight of how the middle class has got absolutely crushed, decimated. Yeah. Yeah. And I used to, I used to think, well, why why do we care about the middle class? What about the working class? Like, but now, like, obviously, you grow up, and you get a bit older, but I, I get it now. I mean, and look at down here. Look down at the bottom, the TVs and stuff like. Do we need another flat screen in the house? Well, they're like, so cheap. <laughs> they're, they're so cheap. I mean, the technology, like you're like, it's just not something you actually need, right? Where look at the top so, hospital yeah. services. Yeah, you need that. And, and I mean, think about how much COVID is, is amplifying that mm -hmm. in that who wants to go work with with three masks on your face in a time I'm exaggerating, but like, yeah, no, I get it. Like those poor doctors, these poor nurses, like, I just can't imagine that being my profession and, and dealing with the issues that are showing up in those hospitals right now. Well, I, I mean, there's a, there's a couple of things to say on that. Cause um, yeah, I've got friends who work in the profession. I spoke to them about it. A couple of the main points is, is the, how hard they've had to work over the last year. Yeah. Uh, under a, a threat of seeing, you know, I know there's some people don't believe COVID is a real thing, but there are doctors and nurses who got COVID and died. So they were losing colleagues. So they felt like they were in a dangerous situation. Uh, they had all these practices whereby they had to follow strict rules for, you know, uh, uh, what they had to wear, uh, how they had to deal with patients. Yeah. It's just a, just a two year stressful Thing. I just can't even yeah. imagine. I can't even imagine being in that space. Yeah. But this goes back to the quote, right? If the currency isn't scarce, yeah. the things that people actually desire will become scarce. And you're seeing it. You're mm -hmm. seeing it in real time in these charts. I could only imagine if we, if this chart was actually up to date. If somebody has it, please share it. Um, if this chart was up to date and we had it out in the 2020, oh, is 2022. There, so one of the things that stands out is the less elastic items seem to be primarily service-based in that you need people 
Whereas yeah. the 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 more elastic is seen to be uh, things that come from production line efficiency. That's right. Yeah, and because of the amount of money that's in the system and the people need the money, mm-hmm. haha, okay, that makes sense. Yep. Yeah. Because what's more scarce than your time, my time, right? Yeah. Human human beings' ability to to actually yeah conduct the work and the energy input. Interesting. Okay. So let's go to the next one here. Okay. This one here is is something that drives me crazy with that how few people understand something as simple as just your discount cash flow math. If you take and so the present value of anything is the future free cash flows up in the numerator. In the denominator, it's the discount rate. So if interest rates Let's just say that you're that you're uh, we're warping back to like the 2007 time frame when you your 10 year treasury was at like five to five and a half percent. Typically, premiums above that risk free rate, two mm-hmm. percent um, for for anything that's in the fixed income space that's that's not government issued, and then another two percent for equity on top of that, like like prime blue chip equity on top of that. So you could say 4% above that 10 year treasury rate. So if we go back into that period of time, that's about a nine to 10% rate. So we'll use 10% to to keep it simple. So your discount rate would be around that 10% mark to figure out the value. So if you can give me a hundred dollars in one year and I'm discounting that at a 10% rate, the value is a thousand bucks, okay? And you can quickly see that if we adjust that discount rate lower, right? What does that do to the to the present value? It shoots the present value up to the moon. So go to the next slide, and we're going to take point one. Oh, I didn't do it, did I? Go back. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So if I thought I had a, I I thought I had it in the slide, but evidently I didn't. If we take the point one and we turn it into point zero one for a one percent discount rate. Today, what's the ten-year Treasury at today? It's 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 coming up, but it's still extremely low. I mean, we got below a one. We were at like fifty basis points. Point point zero zero five is what that got compressed down to. Okay. Okay. So what does that do to the thousand? Well, it turns it into ten thousand. If you're going the fifty bips, it's it's times two of that. It's, it goes to twenty thousand, right? So you're taking something, and, and my point with this is. When you're manipulating that fixed income market, you're not just manipulating the price of bonds. You're literally manipulating the price of everything, especially equity. And the the prices are getting bid because they're just capitalized, meaning they're they're, they become a multiple higher um, because it's it's a that's how all equity is measured. Like if you were going to sell your company, right, or I would sell my company, you'd be talking in multiples, you'd be talking in discount rates and you'd be talking about, all right, so what's the going rates? So if they compress these yields by quantitative easing and these yields keep going lower and lower, you go from companies that should be valued at a thousand to companies that are valued at 20,000. So when we talk about inflation and Michael Saylor talks about this a lot, where he's saying inflation is a vector. If you want to go buy a premium business, well, it's 20x what it was 10 years ago. Talk about hype. I mean, that's some serious inflation. Just think of it like this, Pete. So okay. when we're playing the game, yeah. right? And there, you're inserting cash into the game. The value of everything is going to go up yeah, relative course, yeah. to that cash. Yeah. But it's not just a, like that's a one for one ratio. Like every dollar that gets put into the game, the value of everything proportionally would go up by that one dollar, but it would be much smaller. But equity isn't valued that way. Okay. Equity is valued as a multiple. Oh, I see. I get it. I get it. So yeah, yeah. Okay. So that makes sense. Yeah. So the the inflation in those in those asset prices that are only owned by you and we don't even have those. Like you're not only getting richer in the multiple of the of the fiat entering the game, you're getting richer in the multiples of the equity getting bid because we would do anything to own even one property. Like we are that poor. Like we just we would do anything to have a piece of it. And you're like, well, here's one hundred thousandth of a share of one of my properties you pee on. <laughs> right? <laughs> that's what's being played right now. And that's your no, those are your Robin Hoods. Yeah. 
That's your Robin Hood. Uh, okay. That's, hey, oh, we're going to give you free trades, but we're going to then suck off of your data like a parasite. Hmm. You pee on. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. So that's that's yeah, the yeah. point I'm trying to make is when you're valuing equity and, and you're talking about inflation and it's such a oh smushy word this this inflation thing. Yeah. Uh, boy, is it it does it get convoluted when you start talking about equity premiums and multiples and in discount rates. So go go ahead to the next one and and I had it in there in the parentheses not captured in CPI. Yeah. Right. They're telling you, oh, the price of corn is up, you know, whatever percent. But they don't ever talk about, especially in academia. I got in some Twitter war with some academic one time, and I was like, well, the price of assets aren't even captured in CPI data, and and I mean, they threw a fit, threw a fit because it just breaks whatever model that they think they know about inflation, and it just flips so much of it on its head. And this is why so many people don't understand this stuff. No one talks about it. Yeah. We'll come back to this. Is there, yeah, is, you can skip over. This. Those are words. Let's go yeah, to this. let's sure. go to the charts. Uh, What's yins? <laughs> <laughs> what is yins? It's a Pittsburgh thing. Yeah, it's a Pittsburgh. What does thing. it mean? A, uh, just down here in Nashville, they say y'all. Ah, uh, yins. In Pittsburgh, it's yins. What do we say? You, you lot, you lot. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, you can skip over this. Uh, okay. Okay. So I'm. Th this is a post that I did. Um, these these next couple slides are a post that I did. Uh, I, I don't know, maybe half a year ago. And what I'm trying to do is I'm just trying to frame things for people in a in a very global kind of way. Uh -huh. So these are. This is the top. It's the ch the chart starts. All these lines start at zero. Uh -huh. They're all at the same spot. Uh, back before the 2008 crisis. Okay, you can see the sell-off there, and that yep. was the size of the 2008 crisis compared to how much all of these global indexes have grown since the top uh, in 2007-2008. Oh God! And so when you look at this chart, you can see India. You know, anybody who would look at this chart would be like, "Well, India crushed it, right? U.S. they did pretty well. Uh -huh. Hong Kong." down negative 23 percent since that period of time and so when you're looking at this on a on these are the the major global uh markets yeah. that are out there um in the index that i use for for europe people can go to the sxxp and kind of see what basket that falls into the but there's all your major companies over over in the eu are in that basket all right so but what's what's important? The, 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 <laughs> I'm looking at this guy. Hmm. But the previous chart looks from about 2020 looks the same. <laughs> yes, it, it compares to the money printing chart, and this is what happened in Venezuela when they hit hyperinflation. The first thing that happened was the stock market. Yeah accelerated in growth because there's scarcity in the shares yeah. if, if the company's making money they don't have to debase the shares if they're losing money they've got to debase the shares and come up with cash so that they can keep the thing living but if you're dealing with businesses that actually make money they're not going to debase the shares which means there's that's a scarce thing to own hmm. and uh that's why you're seeing people run to the to the equity market and they're going to continue to run to the equity market in fiat terms on a long enough cycle you're going to see equities melt up in dollar terms and any fiat currency that you want to say it will continue to melt up with enough time right right now it sure don't seem like it but on a long enough time horizon you're going to see it continue to, to melt up um so the thing that's important on this chart is this is this is the performance in local currency terms okay so the ruble is uh for for india right that's in ruble terms for the U.S., that's in dollar terms. Rupee, rupee. So, um, yeah, it shows you how much of an amateur. Just Jeez. sorry, I'm not a, I'm not a big uh, Indian currency person. <laughs> um, Japan, you got the yen. That's the performance in yen. Yeah. Okay. So let's go to the next slide. I'm assuming everything's down against the dollar in this next one. Well, we'll see. Go to the next one. There you go. This is the same exact chart, but I put every index in dollar terms. Okay. So now you can see India still did pretty well at 82% from the top before the 2008 meltdown. But what does this show is that their currency isn't performing? It's it's just putting it when you're looking at that previous chart, 
you don't know. Let's just say that in India, they they heavily debase their yeah. currency yeah. against the dollar. That could be a negative performance as you go from one to the other. Now, obviously, it wasn't, but um, it's it's down significantly from what was it, one eighty? But interestingly, go back one. It was two hundred, so it's one hundred and twenty percent lower when you put it in dollar terms. Yeah, but interestingly, with Hong Kong, yeah, it performed better it's because they had a a very slight uh, improvement in, relative to the dollar over that period of time, and and some of it was uh, if you dig into the numbers, it's almost a near perfect because of them pegging to the dollar. Interesting. Okay, so go to the next. Okay, so we're looking at this. So let's go to the next slide. And so I say, but the dollar itself is changing. Okay, so we're we when we put it all in dollar terms, that made more sense. Yeah. But what if the dollar itself, the thing we're comparing it to, is also shape shifting and and morphing, and different from the top of the market in 2007, 2008 till now. Yeah. And it is because this is the chart. This is this is dollars. If you would go back and you'd look at 2007, 2008 dollars and you compare it to a 2022 dollar, this is the difference. And it's 182%. Is is there's more in the system. Yes. Next chart. You've, so, you, uh, you've accounted for that. Yeah. So we'll, we'll account for that next. So okay. going back to the Monopoly example, right? We're playing the game over some period of time. Mm -hmm. And if we're, if we're using that currency in the game and we started with 100 units in the game, but at the end of the game, there was 200 units in the game. How do you compare it? How do you, how do you compare the moments in time as that currency itself is changing as far as returns and yields go? So that's what we're going to do next. So let's go ahead and jump to the next slide. And now here's Damn. our performance. When we go back into each one of these in this, I think the chart was in weeks. So in a weekly term, in a discrete weekly term, we take those adjustments to M2 to each one of those, to each one of those indexes around the world. Huh. And this is the performance from the top, not from the bottom, but from the top of the 2007, 2008 crisis. And uh, this, this, charts probably two, three weeks old. But at that moment when I captured it, this was uh, a negative 1% return for the US. Now think about this. You're a business creating economic value for society. You're retaining profits. You, you're a life form, right? You are, you are taking energy, turning it into something that the market values. And your return in adjusted to you know, 2007, 2008, right there at that mark, dollars, you've, you've returned negative 1%. You can see how everybody else fared. Yeah. So wow. go, to the, go to the next one. Up, I had up. to put this slide in here. This is totally unfair. And if people are looking at this <laughs> uh, uh, and, and saying, oh, that, that's not even fair, Preston, I agree with you, but it was just fun for me to do. So I put okay. it in there. Okay, go to the next slide. Just for people listening, that's <laughs> that's Bitcoin up 111,000%. I just had to have fun. Yeah, right? I wish I'd bought some about them. Now, I wanted to zoom in here. Okay, yeah. so this is the same chart that we were looking at, the M2 adjusted. Yeah. And let's look at from, from COVID till now. And what I think you're starting to see is you're starting to see many, many credit cycles that are completely dependent on just Fed uh, debasement in inserting this fiat into the system. It's accelerating. And an example I've used a couple of times and people keep teasing me about it, but that's fine. I think it's a good example is just childbirth. So when you start, when a woman goes into labor, the contractions are far apart. They're happening, you know, every 10, 20 minutes, something like that. Uh, maybe even like a half hour. They're not real strong, but they're strong enough that she's like, Hey, get me to the hospital. You get to the hospital and maybe now they're every 10, five, 10 minutes, she's having contractions that are getting stronger, that she's getting uncom uncomfortable. She's saying, hey, get me the epidural. Um, and then you start getting up to like the final moments of the birth and the contractions are so absurdly strong and aggressive, the magnitude of those contractions. Uh, they're happening every minute, every 30 seconds, whatever it is, but the frequency is picking up. So the magnitude and the frequency 
are getting more powerful as time goes on, more energy. Um, so when I'm looking at this chart and I'm looking at the these, you know, everybody's familiar with a business cycle and they say, oh, it's five to eight years is the typical business cycle that we saw it earlier on the first slide that was up there. We were talking about the short term business cycle. I think what you're seeing now is their actions and their manipulations of, of adding credit and adding units into the system is becoming so pronounced and at such a high frequency and at such a high magnitude that you can start to see it graphically representing itself on the chart. So we have, we're going to zoom into that circle that, that, yeah. that's there. So go ahead and hit to the next slide. Okay. So there's the drop. There's the COVID drop. Uh-huh. You saw the stimulus on back on the M2 in the central bank balance sheets of like how much stimulus was added into the system. Yeah. This this is M2 adjusted, okay? And you can see that in the US, which is the dark blue uh line there, the third one down, you can see we barely got to above neutral from where we were at pre-COVID. Barely got there. Mm. And now you're you're negative 16, 17% down from that, from before the COVID drop. And so Dalio, he'll do interviews where he's saying that you're pushing on a string or the, the, the quantitative easing is having less of effect as you go further into time. And I would tell you, this is graphically representing that, that talking point mm. that he often says. Um, and then you can see, uh, you know, Hong Kong and China, the G the uh, GXC there is China. You can see they're just getting crushed in this last cycle when you M2 adjust it. And so they have to step in. They're going to have to step in again. Um, I think it's coming within the coming 12 months that they're going to have to step in aggressively. And it's going to have the, the magnitude of their response is going to be <laughs> huge. And I think that if you M2 adjust it, and you're looking at how much they actually capture out of that, you're going to see it's even harder. It's getting harder and harder for them to stimulate any of this. And so uh, that was really the but point that, of the but, slide. But that is straight Weimar Republic. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So do you think um, do you think hyperinflation is coming or is a possibility of coming? So when people say the term hyperinflation, to me, it's against what? What are you saying it's hyperinflating against? And so we've had hyperinflation against Bitcoin for a decade. Okay. Uh, but I think that almost real world effect of the money you're earning collapsing and you don't yeah. have Bitcoin because plenty of people don't, don't understand it, won't have it. That complete collapse of your money, you know, similar to what happened in the Weimar Republic or even happened in uh, Russia where people were just having to sell anything they could just yeah. to buy. Like, do we see disaster scenarios like that? It's, it's, too difficult for me to be able to theorize what that my assumption is, like. is if they keep doing this that yeah. that comes because yeah the, the playbook's there and when money dies it's whether they stop doing this and they accept well I'll, I'll say this i think that the scenarios where you see this get really bad are the locations where they they don't have access to bitcoin or they're not able to to use that as a unit of account for whatever reason or no reserves yeah is is something like sri lanka foreshadowing what's going to happen in oh yeah nations? i mean turkey's yes. pretty bad as well now yes. that's a very that's a developed nation that's exactly what's foreshadowing yes so if those if those locations have access to bitcoin and people have you know most people have smartphones the the government hasn't done anything crazy with trying to prevent uh, its use. I don't know how they could, to be honest with you, really kind of shut it down in any kind of way that that they can actually enforce. Um, but let's just say that the, that the nation doesn't have it readily available or have a lot of plumbing to incorporate it. They're going to struggle the most with the transition. Why do, why do you have so much conviction regarding Bitcoin? Um, I think it, it comes down to just how difficult it is to to stop it like everything that i've seen it's truly decentralized it actually has a uh, proof of work i think the proof of work is uh what makes it so important is because there's actual economic work associated with those units being put into the game mm -hmm. if we go back and 
that central banker actually had to do some work in order to insert more units into the game. That's a completely different situation than just, all right, yeah, sure. Hey, here's another thousand because that's your proof of stake system. And that's what <laughs> that's what's causing the problem in the first place. Yeah, that, that transition is interesting. The, the only thing I think about with it is, is uh, will there be supply shocks? Um, can everyone get access to it if there, there is a real yeah if there's yeah. a real flight to to Bitcoin you know uh, that those supply shots can become a real issue yes and then will we see some kind of, kind of like reverse weird pricing? there's going to be a lot of weird stuff that pops out of this yeah because you're you're when you think of the whole economic system it's just this giant decentralized uh, the the prices are providing the queuing as to where the ants, the people <laughs> need to go and, and go and perform their, their, their work. Um, they're just sniffing out margin. You know, they're just going around doing economic calculation, whether they know it or not, they're performing, they're constantly performing economic calculation. They're looking at where the margin is because the margin is telling you what the market desires, what the, the participants in the system are desiring. And so when you, when you take these actions and you're doing these things, you're mutilating, you're disrupting that signaling to its core, right? The ants don't know where to go to find the food anymore. They don't know where to go to, to conduct useful activities because the queuing, the, the margin is just completely jacked. The distortion of money. It's distorted beyond comprehension. <sighs> is that the last chart? It's yeah, it's so it's good enough. I mean, so, <laughs> so, so, so I you, don't know what comes next. But you took, you, you took everyone through this. Yeah. Yeah. Were, were 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 people shocked? Were they like, I had no idea what was going on? Because I I feel like we've been discussing this on Bitcoin Twitter and amongst friends and on podcasts for yeah. I feel like it's almost like Caitlin Long and Travis Kling were talking to us about this like two and a half years ago, and then we've spoken about it and we've seen people talking about it on Twitter. But we're we're fully aware of what is happening right now. My friends just think, oh, we're just in a slightly d difficult economic period. Yeah, there's a bit of inflation. We'll be we'll be fine in a year. They've got no idea this complete unwind collapse could be coming. Reality doesn't care what your opinion is. Yeah, <laughs> I know it does not care whether you've got a strong opinion because it's just going to do what it does. It's it's just math and physics, and it's just going to work itself out until it. You know, I would I would explain it like you know you go and you pour toxic sludge into a pond and nature is going to try to figure out a way to deal with it and it might end up being some weird colored red bacteria that then grows out of that and somehow filters it and, and removes it from from the pond and i would describe bitcoin as kind of being that thing that's emerging out of the ether that is dealing with the toxic sludge that's that's there and getting worse and um i just you know for me it's going to deal with it and it's going to deal with it in a way that actually benefit some some actors probably a smaller number of people that are the first movers and then the people in the middle are actually going to see relief through this um on a long enough time scale they'll look back at the end of their life and they'll be like that was really beneficial that that happened because i ended up having a better life and then the people who are really just and 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 a lot of these people are the ones who hold a majority of the of the buying it's the guy winning the game right now right he doesn't want this new system to come along because he's in that crushing in that reset relatively speaking he's not as powerful as he was when he was you know at that point in the game and so they're the ones that are going to pay most of the bill they're still going to be in a very good position to to do whatever they want in their life, most likely, but they're probably going to be the ones that are fighting it the most. They're going to be the late adopters and they're going to be the ones who in the end are going to look back and be like, man, I shouldn't have been fighting it. I should have been uh, assisting it and probably, trying to help. Probably have to sell off some of their assets. <laughs> they're going to have to say, and that's it. I, I have it pinned right now, um, but that's what my quote that I have pinned on my profile is. Uh -huh. Uh, Danny, I don't know if you yeah. can bring that up quickly, but you can sh you can read the quote. That's what my quote is all about, is once you get far enough on the other side of this, 
how a lot of this Bitcoin is going to really distribute itself, like the actual Bitcoin units are going to distribute themselves throughout the world is going to be people like me are then going to start buying equity. And who am I going to buy it from? I'm going to be buying it from the person who has to sell their equity because they've got to have some of this in their portfolio and they've got to uh, make that transition. So yeah, dear stock and bond holders, I don't think you appreciate the discount rate that my Bitcoin deserves. I have no intention of trading it for profit, producing equity until the existing multiples are drastically lower than what you get with this worthless fiat. There are many like me. <laughs> We're coming for you. That goes back to the to the equation, the, the real generic discount cash flow equation that we were talking about earlier. So like discount rates in in equities today is like a multiple of 30. It's cr that's crazy. Like so I'm what not it, paying that. So is is what you're really saying here, there's gonna be a, there's a swing to Bitcoin. Yeah. The people have been accumulating Bitcoin. Not everyone, we have our sailors, but there's a lot of plebs, a lot of norm normies. If we then have this swing to Bitcoin out of fear someone like myself suddenly swings to being one of the people with more capital. And as people require that capital, I get to take some of their assets off them. That's right. So this is like a, this is like a rebalancing. Absolutely. That's that is beautiful. It is beautiful. And so, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're the guy winning the game right now and you're holding just tank loads of equity, uh, you're going to have to sell it eventually. And I hate to tell you, you're not going to be selling it at multiples of 30 or 35. You're probably going to be selling it at multiples of 10 or five. Or I have a feeling that the swing, when it when it eventually goes, the the multiples in equity are going to be uh, very juicy. <laughs> and at that point, it makes way more sense for me to own equity than own Bitcoin because those companies are going to be dealing in Bitcoin. They're going yeah. to be making Bitcoin, right? And so then I want to own the equity because you know, at a PE of five, it's making 20% a year in Bitcoin. And I'd rather own that than just owning Bitcoin. And the new game has been reset without any ability to manipulate it. And that's why I'm here. That's why I'm here. There's nobody controlling a ledger. There's nobody saying, oh, we'll settle in 30 days when the gold arrives. No, uh, here's my here's my public address. Send it right now. I can see it pending in the, in the mempool and I know that it's coming. And then when it clears, then we can exchange whatever good it is. And like, how in the world do you defeat that? You don't. You the, All you can do is participate in that system because it doesn't require any trust. It clearly works. It's just code. It's fully auditable. Every time I accept it, it's like me running the gold through the machine and flattening it out. And actually every single Checking time. Yeah. yeah. That's why I run a node. Oh, man. I tell you, it's lucky we have Bitcoin because. Thank God we got Bitcoin. Weird shit going on now. I can only imagine how weird this would get if yeah. we didn't have Bitcoin. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do, you, I, do you think there's people perhaps within the US government who kind of recognize this and recognize the advantageous position the US has in that it has the majority of the Bitcoin companies and probably a disproportionate higher share of Bitcoin. Do you think there's anyone who's like making those calculations? I don't know. I would I would think just based on how many people are in the world, I think there's people out there that are seeing some of this. Um, I don't know that they fully wrapped their head around uh, how big it really is, but there there has to be. There has to be people out there. I mean, the Ross Stevens of the world, like people like that, yeah. there, there are billionaires out there that are accumulating this. And from their vantage point, they don't have to be really right about this. Like if, if, a, if a person has a portfolio of a billion plus, they've just got to have a 1% position to, at today's price, you know, where it's at in the adoption curve. I think one to 5% position in this, and they're fully protected with their buying power uh -huh. on the other side. So when when you get to that level, you know, they're playing a lot of defense um, as they get more confidence in their position. Hey, maybe they bump it up to 10, 10%, right? If you had 10% today and you were a billionaire, you're going to be 10 times richer on the other side of this than you were before it even happened. The asymmetric opportunity. That's how asymmetrical yeah. this is at this point in time. Now, if the price went to five hundred thousand dollars of Bitcoin, now all of a sudden they have to have they have to have a ten percent position to protect them if if this is playing out like we just described. Oh, so so we go from a position where they should 
where until to where they have to. And and the further you go down the path, the more it's going to be. All right, I have Undeniable. to have this much of a position, yes, to protect myself from just. I mean, they don't have to. They if if they don't mind losing some of their some of their net worth and their buying power, well, then they can have a smaller position. But I think it's gonna I think it's gonna start evolving to that. But what's gonna be weird for people is they're gonna look at the price of five hundred thousand, and then they're gonna really be saying, "Oh, I can't afford that." Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> do, do you know what? Uh, I mean, I I first bought Bitcoin when it was eighty pound. I didn't hodl any of it back then, and I've bought I've bought Bitcoin. All different prices. Never once have I ever bought Bitcoin and thought, hmm, that's cheap today. Yeah. Even never. E even now, if Bitcoin dipped dip to 20K, I'd yeah. be straight in buying and I'd still be thinking, fucking hell, that's a lot of money yeah. for, 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 for some ones and zeros. Yeah. Like it's it's that weird thing where it just never feels cheap. Yeah. Um, but you know you have to have it. Hey, I said something earlier that I want to clar clarify for people. I said I'm stacking cash since like the start of the year. I have not sold one Bitcoin, right? This is with my free cash flows yeah. and people have to understand that. So like when, when I look at capital allocation, I'm a, when I find something that I really like and I start amassing it, you know, I'm buying, I'm not selling it. I'm not realizing capital gains and playing all that. Cause I don't know, th this is the hard part. I don't know when the fed's going to reverse course and say enough's enough. We're back in the basing mode that could happen tomorrow. Mm. Well, that we talk it about this. in a year. Yeah, knowing tops and bottoms is hard, and you've also got to account for twenty percent of the uh, capital gains within that as well. And then it's like, oh, where's the bottom? It's like it's a tight range to play in when yeah. when when you know this is a decade play. Yeah, it's, I just keep stacking. I just know, I just know right now, fiat is bidding. Yeah, as much as that sounds strange for people, especially after all the charts we just showed. It's bidding. It's probably going to bid for a, a short window at the longest, I would say a year um, that it could bid without something really breaking. And while it's doing that, I'm just stacking fiat because that's the thing that's outperforming. And once I feel like they've totally reversed course, I just take that clump of you know stacking of fiat that I've got and I just drop it right on top of the pile of Bitcoin that's that's there. And then, and then it's just whatever my free cash flows are each month. It's just going straight into Bitcoin during that period of time. Did you hear him say pile? <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Wow. Uh, mixed feelings. Uh, uh, mildly scared and quite optimistic. I I don't think there's. I I don't want to say anything my, that ever scared. Like, my fear is more. It's not on a personal level. My fear yeah. is more civil unrest, societal yes. collapse, what it means to people. That's the stuff that I worry about and just naturally do. We need people in this space who have been in this space for a while that have the financial means to just have deep empathy mm. for the collective that are going through. They've been playing a game that has been extremely unfair. It's been rigged. It's been rigged and the education system is not there to inform people as to th these things that we were talking about. And so most people are performing productive value to society, but they're performing it in this system that has just totally sheltered mm. them from being able to access and understand. And everybody's got to take self-responsibility. Like I, I will, I, I really want to push this idea of, of extreme ownership. Uh, the Jacko book, right? Like that's one of the core things from my military background that like anything that happens bad in my life, I immediately point to myself. I'm like, all right, what can you do different or, or what did you do to bring that upon yourself? But what I would say is we are about to go through just change that I don't think people can comprehend. And if you have the financial means and you have the, the, the ability to just harness that deep empathy that I know everybody listening to this has for other human beings and go out of your way to just even small things, large things, the whole Bitcoin beach story, like a hundred thousand dollars went down there and look at the, look at the impact that that has had in that local community and then the country and then other countries, like the ripple effect mm -hmm. of that action is so profound and so deep. And I would just challenge people to think about the re the the reciprocals that pop out of this the fractal that spins out of that one action 
And we need so much of that during this transition. And the more that the empathy that this community can harness for others is going to be the thing that I think truly makes this, uh, I don't want to say the Ray Dalio phrase because I hate it, but it, it begins with a B and it ends with leverage. It'll make it more like that. I don't know that you're going to get that, but I think that um, it's going to bridge that transition a whole lot better. Okay, yeah. man. Well, it's beautifully put. Uh, thank you. That was really, oh, really awesome. My pleasure. Uh, great to see you, man. Great seeing uh, you, Pete. We don't get to hang out enough, but when we do, um, I always appreciate seeing you, man. Uh, do you want to tell anyone where to go? I mean, everyone who listens to my podcast probably, <laughs> probably knows about um, the investor network that you have, and we study billionaires. And I saw, I, I noticed actually there was a. Have you got a new show within the feed, the blue one? We yeah, we've we've got a bunch of different hosts yeah. kind of covering all aspects of finance. Yeah. Um, you know, not everybody's down the Bitcoin train like you and me, but um, we try to put out a lot of content around just finance in general, and and it's all about education and uh, teaching people discount cash flow models and whatever, right? All the all the fun stuff. Well, listen, I'm in your shadows and I love it, but uh, keep doing what you're doing, Preston. Hopefully, you. I uh, every few months we get to do this. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Pete.